Welcome to Restoration Church. My name is Andrew. I'm so excited that you're here. And today we are kicking off a new series called Does God Damn? So uh, Nate, our senior pastor, apparently thought it was a good idea to make this series that could be kind of controversial, have a lot of difficult subjects in it. And then he said, you know who should kick it off? The guy who up until a year and a half ago was living off of Oreos and milk in his dorm room. That's the guy who will knock this out of the park. So needless to say, I've had a little anxiety as I've been going through and thinking about what I'm going to say and how I'm going to shape this entire uh, thought process and what we're going to be covering. And so we are actually going to be looking at the book of Jonah throughout this series. And if you know anything about the story of Jonah, uh, Jonah was a man who uh, was a preacher, he was a prophet of God, and he was called to go to a city called Nineveh, which he refused to do. He gets taken away, he, he tries to run, and then he gets swallowed up by a whale, is in its belly for three days, gets thrown back up on the beach when he finally decides to go to Nineveh, goes to Nineveh, and Nineveh repents, and they, they give glory to God, and they start following him despite what Jonah was praying. See, Jonah, after he preached in the city of Nineveh, actually went outside of it and prayed that the whole city would be destroyed. So we're going to be looking at that, and through that framework, we're going to be unpacking the idea of does God damn? And so I want you to take away this point. We're going to be unpacking it through the sermon. We're going to be looking at it. We're going to be thinking about it. So take this point, listen to it carefully, and then we'll see it pop up over and over again as I go through the first three verses of Jonah. And this is the point. It is often in our capacity to forgive that we see the entirety of God's grace. So we're going to be continuing to look at that. And so I decided that uh, to open this up and to start it, I was going to invite you into a time in my life where I had to forgive someone for a a pretty difficult trial that I went through. Um, I think I was about five years old at the time, and as a five-year-old, I saved up like a dollar, dollar fifty cents, and I was very excited because I went and I bought myself some bubblicious bubble tape, which I was so excited about. And so I decided when I was a kid that I was going to make it last as long as possible. So every day I would take my little bubble tape and I would open it and I would pull out the teeniest little sliver I could and I would close it and I would take that little sliver and I would eat it. And that was all for the day. That was all I would eat. And so I must have done this for what felt like then like two months. In reality, it was probably about a week. But it felt like I had been doing this forever, and I was so excited because I was just going to get to keep using uh, my bubble tape. And then one day, I walk into my room, and I notice it's in a different spot than I normally leave it. And so I go over, and I open it, and I look inside, and like a monster, my little brother had just taken a bite out of the side of it. So all my bubble tape was gone, and it was ruined, and I was distraught. And I had to overcome that. I, I know that that's, that was a pretty serious trial in my childhood. To this day, I think it's the reason that I eat my food faster than anyone else, because I'm scared they're going to ruin it for me. But in all seriousness, the idea of does God damn was something that I had to wrestle with for a very long time in my faith and in uh, everything I was going through as uh, when I was in ninth grade, I was actually an atheist, so I didn't believe in God. And part of it had to do with this question of how could God damn people to hell? I don't understand. I can't comprehend it. And so as we go through this sermon, I'm going to try my best to impart some knowledge to you that's hopefully comforting and helps us understand what's going on when this happens. And so you probably have your own questions and your own thoughts about, does God damn, what does it look like? You know, who, you know, where do I fit into this? Am I going to heaven? And all of these things might be things that you're wrestling with. And so my goal and my hope today is that I can give you 
some relief and help you understand and feel comforted. And we're going to go through this with looking at it from Jonah's perspective. So, uh, to give a little preface, we're about to read the first three verses of Jonah. So in Jonah 1, I'm going to read these. And it says, The Lord gave the message to Jonah, son of Amati, uh, Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. I cannot pronounce that word. It's too many SH noises. Uh, bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. So if I can give you some context to how far he was actually running, if you were to look at like a map of Europe in the Middle East, uh, Tarshish would be in what is now commonly referred to as Spain, and Nineveh would have been in modern-day Iraq. So there's like a distance of like 2,500 miles that he's trying to get away from this city. So today, as we look through this story and we begin to grapple and wrestle with it, we are going to be following two simultaneous things that are occurring. One, we're going to be following the story of the man who runs, and two, the city that rebels. So I'm going to give you some context to what Nineveh was like and why Jonah probably ran away. And to give you some warning, I didn't announce in the first service that what I'm about to read is not child-friendly, so I guess there are people like covering their children's ears and like running out of the service. So I'm giving you a preface that what I'm about to read is very disturbing. Um, the rulers of Nineveh were known to be uh, some of the most cruel people on the face of the earth. They were part of the kingdom of Assyria, and the kingdom of Assyria was very famous because they liked honey. They really, really liked honey because they could take honey, and when they went to a city and conquered a foreign king, they could chop that king's head off, put it in the honey, and carry it back to their capital, and it wouldn't decompose because honey stops uh, decomposition, so the, the head would be perfectly preserved. So that's a little bit of what these people are like. And I'm going to read you something else that's even more grisly and disgusting of what they did. Um, so this was written in the temple of Nimrod, one of the rulers of Assyria. And this is what he did to a city that was rebelling against him. He said, I built a pillar at the city gate and I flayed all of the chief men who had revolted. And I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up inside of the pillar some I impaled upon the pillared stakes. So this is who God has asked Jonah to go speak to. So if you can put yourself in his shoes when he's given this command to go preach to a city where something they do to teach people who disagree with them is flay them or store their heads in honey, that's a pretty terrifying prospect. So Jonah is dealing with this. And imagine, like, if there's anyone on earth who deserves to be destroyed, it's the people who are making towers out of skin. Like, they are the people who do not deserve God's repentance and God's salvation. But for whatever reason, against all odds, God is calling him to go to these people to preach a message of hope and salvation. And so Jonah, of course, he doesn't want anything to do with this at all. And you can kind of understand why. Because these people are so horribly wicked that they don't deserve all the grace and the love that God has offered to Jonah and offered to those people. So, as we wrestle with this idea of does God damn, I started thinking about it, and I was like, how do I explain it in a way that, you know, fully answers that question, that, that dives into it, gives us a complete and fuller understanding? And because I know that I'm not capable, I'm going to let someone else who's much smarter explain it. Uh, there's an author who I hope you know, and if you don't, I would encourage you to pick up anything he wrote, and that's C.S. Lewis. 
He, I've read everything he's ever written because he has radically changed my faith. And one of the books that really rocked me and made me begin to think was this book called The Great Divorce. And the concept of The Great Divorce is that C.S. Lewis starts out in hell and he makes a journey up to heaven. And so when he's there, he kind of has this discussion with um, one of the people in heaven. And he says, he gets told this, and I love it. I mean, I honestly believe if I could, I would just sit here and read C.S. Lewis to you all day, and then we could go home. But I'll read you this short excerpt. I willingly believe that the damned are, in one sense, successful, rebels to the end, and that the doors of hell are locked on the inside. All that are in hell choose it. Without self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek find, and to those who knock it is opened. And yourself in a dark hour may, will, in a grumbling mood, embrace it. You can repent and come out of it again, but there, are many, there may come a day when you can do that no longer. There will be no you left to criticize the mood. And so what is he unpacking here? Is he saying that this act of rebellion, this act of embracing a, a nature that is contrary to God slowly whittles away at who you are as a person. It'll slowly change your life and slowly allow more death until there's no you left to breathe life into. See, and this is the opinion Jonah is approaching the city of Nineveh with. He's believing full-heartedly that this city has already given up. It's too wicked to ever come back. See, but God didn't believe that. See, he began to chase Jonah to the ends of the earth because he knew there was a hope in Nineveh. So Jonah, as the man who runs, is necessary to save the city who rebels. So as, these, as he's running and trying to get away, he's thinking that he understands better than God does what's actually happening. And I began to think about this, and I started to think, how does this apply to us today? How does this uh, fit into our lives and oftentimes, we can find ourselves in one of these two camps. We can either be the man who runs or the city who rebels. And so it takes a lot of introspection and looking into yourself and honest evaluation to begin to figure out, what am I doing in my journey with God? Is there a place that I am supposed to be going that I refuse to go to? And are there cities in my life that are in rebellion. And so often, we kind of find ourselves in both camps simultaneously, where there's something we know we're supposed to be doing, but we can't because we're not allowing God to redeem the parts of us that are broken, that are falling apart. See, one of the things that I began to understand when I thought of the character of Jonah was the greatest tragedy he was committing was he was not freely giving the revelation that was given to him. And so what Jonah is doing as, as he refused to go is, man, Jonah was lucky enough to know the grace of God. He was lucky enough to know that God had forgiven him, that God was pursuing him, that wanted a relationship with him. He had that knowledge, and he refused to give it out freely. And so this harkens back to our main point it's often in our capacity to forgive that we see God's grace. So, so oftentimes, it becomes necessary for us to begin the forgiving process in order to understand the depths of the forgiveness God has poured out onto us. See, I remember when I was in college, I, I, was, I was there and we had this professor 
And one time he was sharing some of his theology with us. He was talking about what he believed about God, how, how he thought the world operated. And so he's beginning to, he said something, and I don't remember what he said, but he said something, and I remember one of my friends raising his hand. He was sitting right next to me, and he says, will you unpack that statement for me? And I remember my college professor looking at him and saying, no, I'm going to let you do that yourself. And it bothered me. And for some reason, like, I, I began to get so, like, uncomfortable, and, and I'm working through this, this, like, why is this so annoying me? And I just remember days and weeks of just not understanding why this bothered me so much that, that he had said this to my friend. And, and finally... After a while, I began to realize what was going on in my heart was my friend was there eagerly, eagerly asking for the revelation my professor had already received. And instead of welcoming him into that, welcoming him into a, a new statement or a new thought process, he was guarding it selfishly to himself. He refused to allow others into the ideas and the thoughts that he had. Man, one of the most convicting things for me as I began to think about this is how often do I live out my faith the same way my college professor treated my friend? How often do I refuse to share the most amazing news the world has ever known? Because I'm the man who runs. Man, uh, sometimes I catch myself thinking there's no point in sharing this news because they're not going to get it. They're not going to understand. They don't know. They, they'll never come. Man, how selfish and arrogant of me to think something like that. And so I often find myself in the man who runs shoes because I refuse to go into the Ninevehs in my life and I don't know what the Ninevehs in your life are. Maybe it's your job, it might be your marriage, it might be your families. But I can tell you honestly, one of the craziest things that's happened to me since I, I've come out here and I've become the youth pastor is, man, I meet kids who walk into situations every day that would blow your mind. Families who don't care about them, don't love them, parents who have left and yet they still come to our youth group and to our church every single Sunday. And so I sit there and I begin to think about myself. And I think about the journey I walked to come to Christianity, to end up on the stage here as a youth pastor at Restoration. And I begin to think, man, I had parents who loved me. I had parents who made me go to church, who encouraged me to follow God even when I was walking as an atheist, what if I was one of those kids who my family was Nineveh? My family was rebelling. I don't think I would have made it. I wouldn't be here. Man, what conviction that brings into my life. Uh, if I could have the band come up. So I, I began to walk through this, this process and, and this thinking of what does it mean to be the man who runs? What does it mean to be the city in rebellion? And, and I came to kind of, you know, two conclusions to two stories. Um, for the man who runs, the conclusion I came to, and I'm going to break it down in an analogy where I can, this is the best way I could understand it. Um, uh, right now, my other job, other than being youth pastor, is I work at Wentworth Douglas. I, I'm working in, uh, in their kitchen. And so when I work in their kitchen, I, um, my job is I stock all the shelves. I stock all the items that come in that they then ship out, to, you know, they send to patients and things like that. And one of the things I noticed on the side of just about every single box that walks through those doors, is printed on it several times, there is a statement that says, not for resale. 
And I started thinking, man, do I live my faith like it's not for resale? Do I live a faith where I refuse to freely give what was freely given to me? And the scariest part of that question is sometimes I have to say, yeah, I do. Man, God gave Jonah grace and freedom and love without asking anything. And Jonah refused to go and share that with those who needed it. Man, one of the greatest parts of the story of Jonah as we jump into the city who rebels is when Jonah comes and he speaks the truth and he speaks that revelation into their lives. They don't slam the doors. They don't keep chopping off people's heads and putting it in honey pots. Man, they repent. They say, this is what we've been looking for. This is the truth. And C.S. Lewis, like he said so beautifully, he said, no soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find, and to those who knock, it is opened. Man, Nineveh was seeking God. And God knew that, but Jonah refused to believe it. Man, I don't want to live my life as the man who runs. I want to live my life as the man who has courage to walk into Nineveh. And so often, we have to find that in our own lives. Like the kids who I'm talking about, they have to go home every day to a city of Nineveh and be the only light that they will ever see. And in your life, you might have to do that in your workplace, in your marriage, with your family. I don't know, and I can't begin to imagine the journey you're walking. But man, don't live a faith that is not for resale. See, one of the things that, um, that I began to understand about God and the city of Nineveh is God will pursue you to the ends of the earth. See, I remember when, when I was younger, and I think I was about to go off to college, uh, one of my little sisters, she was so angry that I was going to college. And she didn't know how to express it. She didn't know, but I knew she was angry. And I just remember, every day, I would walk up to her, and I would just hug her. And I remember her punching me and kicking me and refusing to let me touch her because she had that anger inside of her. But every single day, I would hug her. Man, I have one of the best relationships with that sister now. Because I pursued her when she didn't want to be pursued. And that's the reality of what God is doing to Nineveh in that moment. He is saying to Jonah, I know you think it's worthless. I know you think they're at the end. I know you think they won't repent, but I will pursue them to the ends of the earth. You'll run 2,500 miles away. I will take you back. And no matter what you've done, no matter where you've gone, you will be my people. And so to wrap up with, with this thought of does God damn? And I may be a heretic for saying this. I may not quite have it right, but the only way I can rationalize and understand it is to say nobody allows us to damn ourselves. And what that means is he loves us so much he's not going to make us follow him. See, I could have taken my little sister and I could have held her and never let her go until she said she loved me. 
But that's not love. That's force and coercion. Man, God looks at you and he says, I love you so much that I'm going to let you choose the path you walk. And if you want to walk in distance from me, then you can. But I'm waiting here for you. And maybe you never experienced that. But man, I would encourage you, think of the circumstances that brought you here today. The ridiculousness of how you ended up in Restoration Church in the middle of Dover. Man, that is God pursuing you to the ends of the earth. Your life has led up to this. He's waiting. And he sent the man who runs in me to come find the cities in you. And I'm so thankful for that. So in just a moment... We're going to do one minute of reflection where the band's just going to play. play. And I would encourage you to start to pray. Start to think through, wh- where am I in my life? Am I the man who runs? Is there people I need to speak to but I refuse to? Uh, am I a city in rebellion? Are there things in my life I need to give up? Have I chopped the head off and put it in honey lately? So begin to pray. And our prayer team will be up here. They'll be waiting for you to come and embrace the God of the universe. So if you'll bow your heads with me, dear God, we thank you that you pursue us to the ends of the earth, that you follow us no matter where we go, that you love us as much as you loved Jonah, that you give us the opportunity come home to you. We thank you that you give us the choice to love you. In your name we pray. Amen.